Hi, everybody. Before we get started, I have a question for you. So a little bit of participation on your behalf. How many of you have already been thinking about responsible AI or fair AI? Just show hands. Awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, I was not even, this was not on my radar 12 months ago. And a very smart and uh, good, well, good friend and a smart colleague, uh, Lena Bengali, uh, suggested that we look a little more closely into AI standards and tools. And part of the impetus for that was a White House request to the National Institute for Standards and Tools for them to engage with the bigger community and consider what tools and standards they should develop for artificial intelligence. She suggested this, and my first thought was, oh my goodness, it's gonna be, this is just big and hairy and a lightning rod and I don't wanna do this. But, but her instincts are always so good about what's important that she got the team to really do a little bit of research and consider what can we do as good corporate and global citizens to try to help the community guide AI a little bit better. And so in doing this research, I came across a lot of information, sorted through a lot of information, and actually some old stories that uh, came to light. Uh, so there's a thread of some thinking, I think, that goes back quite some time. So many years ago, this picture is actually from a 1960. So this is the uh, US uh, Nuclear Command Center. And they, as you would imagine, had and still have very advanced, well-engineering early detection of threat. So they have a lot of systems out there in the world to try to detect if there's a possible issue. And interestingly, uh, October 5th, uh, 1960, they believed that we were under a massive Soviet nuclear attack, that something was coming. And what's interesting is at this point in uh, 1960, is that with the technology, they believed that we had about 30 minutes until something could make its way from the early detection to the US. And with a little bit of uh, analysis, that the, the president would have about 10 minutes to make a decision. And you can imagine with any kind of a system that was this serious and this well engineered, they also were looking at well, what's our accuracy? So they wanted to know what the accuracy, what's the predictions? And interesting on this one is their prediction. Their system said, we're certain with 99.9% .9 assurity that there's an attack coming. We went into DEF CON 1. Uh, they started doing all sorts of analysis, looking at the systems. And there was one gentleman who did not look at the system itself, but said, what's going on right now in world politics? Where are things at? And he happened to notice that Khrushchev was in the US at this point. He was part of the UN delegation. And so this, the likelihood of attack, just by human reasoning, was next to nothing. So they were able to walk back from DEF CON 1 and prevent something catastrophic from happening uh, based on what their systems that they had worked so hard on and were actually really well engineered had indicated what was going on. Now, any history buffs out there that want to take a guess as what early warning system was actually detecting? This was in Greenland is where the system was doing the detection. Yes? Oh, what? It's the one where I thought was the moon was the... It's absolutely, yes. The moon was rising over Norway. And in Greenland, it looked like a massive attack. So, yeah, and, and thank goodness somebody had the human oversight and the thought to say, hey, wait a second, let's look at what else is going on. And this is an example of trying to marry technology and human oversight and why that's so important. But it also, the reason why this story came to mind as I was doing research on artificial intelligence and being more responsible is in my mind, I was leaking, there was some linking to some things that I was seeing out there. And so there's this belief in the magical technology that's going to solve everything. I think Lance was basically gave us a couple examples on this whole silver bullet thinking and the a trough of disillusionment, the hangover afterwards. But we're seeing some of the same stuff. So it's very human for us to want to see this new technology and say, 
this is going to solve all my problems. And a little bit, a, a few of the myths that I'm seeing that I think are actually impacting the way we implement AI today is, you know, new is better. If it's shiny, I'm really excited. Uh, I want to do news articles because it's different. I want to fund that. Uh, I want the classes are going to be in this new technology, and I may be overlooking things that currently exist or could be developed that, that may even be better. Um, the other thing that I find really interesting is there's this idea that there's an unavoidable trade-off between accuracy and fill in the blank. Now, usually that is accuracy and interpretability or accuracy and privacy, but that's actually been shown that that is not unavoidable. It might be a little harder. It might not be in every case, but it's not unavoidable. If you carefully select and craft your models, that you can have um, both accuracy and um, either interpretability or, or privacy. The other myth that's interesting is all I need is more data. And I don't know how many times I've heard from data scientists, if I just had more data, I could be accurate and things would be perfect. But if you think about things like bias and data, if I'm just adding more biased data, then I'm not really fixing anything. I still have a problem. So it's not just about volume. It's also about quality uh, of data as well. Uh, and the fourth myth that I see impacting us now is the idea that we can take something that was developed for, let's say, a movie recommendation. Very important. Um, but if I'm recommending movies to somebody and I have a 5% error rate, that, OK, I can, maybe I can live with that. And maybe because I'm, I have cost-sensitive issues, that's OK. But if I'm trying to predict patient care or patient outcomes, 5% may not be OK. And I also want to know why a decision was made. I really don't care why a decision was made on a movie, or maybe I care less. Um, so these kind of, I would almost say, magical thinking about AI is causing us to see a lot of uncomfortable results. Uh, one example that uh, I think we're probably, most of us are probably familiar with is this idea of uh, biased AI. Uh, the first example here is about bias in data itself. So I, I don't know how easy it is to read, but the blue is uh, male, uh, red is female. Uh, in technical roles at some high-tech companies, we've got Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft. Uh, and you can see it skews to, uh, to male right now. Well, Amazon had a recruiting tool that they shut down after they realized it was biased against women. They hadn't intended for that. They actually would like to see more balance. But they were basing their AI recruiting based on what their current employees looked like. Now, they weren't looking at names, so they didn't explicitly know a gender. But it turns out when you look at LinkedIn profiles and resumes of men and women, uh, men and women have a tendency to choose different sports. We have a tendency to choose different social activities or clubs. And also interesting is we choose different adjectives to describe our accomplishments. So the AI was picking up on these differences and trying to find recruits that matched what they saw was successful internally. And so bias in data, uh, unintentionally, can leak into our, our results. Um, the other example here, uh, this is some photos from the Gender Shade Project, is on facial recognition. And I would say recognition in general is kind of a tricky area. Uh, but there's been a lot of calls for regulation on the use of facial recognition after this project and some other uh, stories have come out, where they looked at how good is face recognition depending on your gender and uh, the shade, your skin color shade. And what they found out is if you were a white male, 1% error. They could see you, recognize you, follow you. No, not bad at all. It's actually pretty good. Uh, if you were a darker skinned female on the other side, your error rates were in 35% area uh, as low as that. Now, if it's just a game that you're playing, OK, maybe not such a big deal. Uh, but consider the use of this, and it is used, in security. Facial recognition is used in policing in certain areas. And so the potential impact is significant. And that's why even Amazon is asking, I think this article's from July, uh, is asking uh, the US to consider, the US federal um, system to consider regulating facial recognition software as well. Because there's bias in data, potentially, or bias in algorithms in the, the second case. So beyond bias, there's also another uh, area that I hadn't thought a lot about but is kind of concerning, is this unknowable AI. 
So a lot of us have heard about the idea of black box. It's very hard to explain what happens, but if it's accurate, who cares? Um, but there's risk assessment software called Compass that's used uh, in multiple cities in the US and Canada that does risk assessments. And in this particular example, uh, Glenn Rodriguez, who's in the picture here, uh, was sentenced after uh, participating in a robbery when he was 16. He spent 10 years being a model uh, inmate. He did a lot of volunteer programs. He went through and tried to mentor other people on how to do better. And when it came time for parole, or and to go before the hearing, everybody, including himself and his lawyers, and even the parole board was in favor initially of granting him parole, but they denied it and they said it was because the risk score that the Compass, office gave, the Compass software gave him was a high risk score. They were surprised, but they weren't willing to go against the software. And you can imagine his, you know, you're, of course he was disappointed and the lawyer said, okay, well, tell us how this assessment happened. Tell, tell me how you came up with the score. There's over 100 different factors that go into how it assess risk and lots of different weights. And it was deemed protected uh, because of commercial proprietariness that they couldn't share that with him. So you can imagine if you're denied something, uh, insurance, credit, parole, and to not be able, not even have the rights to look at how that score came up. Uh, he eventually, after being denied twice uh, on a third subsequent uh, parole, he eventually did get parole. Uh, they found looking into the data and comparing his scores and answers to questions to other people's scores, that there was one question in particular that was subjective that would have changed his risk score significantly, and they suspect that's what it was, but they can't know. Uh, so when I think about unknowable AI, there's two different types, uh, or any kind of unknowable software. There's the type where it's just really complex and it's hard for us to understand. And then there's the type that we're not allowed to look at. Uh, and both of those can be a problem depending on the situation. So the third type of uh, issue with AI that I think we need to think about is inappropriate AI. And this is where AI is working exactly like it was supposed to but maybe shouldn't. So Lance said this morning, just because we can doesn't mean we should. That is what this is about. So the Chinese have implemented a social credit system that will credit both your uh, financial, or your financial credit worthiness is also your social worthiness. And it takes into account things you might consider, like were you late paying a bill, uh, but also things that you wouldn't, at least in this country, normally include that are behavioral. Did you jaywalk? And they can use facial recognition to see and track if you jaywalk. Let's hope their facial recognition's good. Uh, they can do the same if you s smoke in a non-smoking area. That can affect your social score. And that can impact everything from whether you get a mortgage, what your rent cost, to whether you can get high-speed internet. So a lot of ramifications to your right rights, and they believe by next year there'll be 1.4 billion people that have a score. So this for me is an example of can, but perhaps shouldn't. I don't believe we should. So these three areas for me, really the idea of bias and data and algorithms, uh, unknowable AI and maybe inappropriate in an AI is really kind of set it in my, uh, I was gonna say my bones, that we have a responsibility as creators of artificial intelligence and the systems that rely on them to guide how they're implemented and developed uh, in a way that fits with our social values. Now that's different for every country and different cultures and where it's implemented. I think in this country, uh, for me, I think about things like accountability, which requires some sort of transparency. I think about fairness, which is a lot about appropriateness. Is this decision appropriate? And I think about public trust, which has two components. Is the system operating as intended? And is it operating as the users expect it to be? So as expected by the end users. So I'd like to do a double click into why AI and context together make sense. Um, but first, to just clarify, when I talk about AI and AI systems, I'm talking about the what. So the processes that have been developed 
to have some kind of action similar to the way a human does. And that is very probabilistic. So you think about how you and I make a decision. I'm never 100% sure. Uh, usually, I, I'm hopefully, I, it's probable this is a good solution, that's, or this is a good decision, that's why I make it. But it's very probabilistic, we never know for sure. Machine learning is the how of it. So we have what, and then we have the how. So that's really about the algorithms that, tr that are trying to iterate to optimize a solution based on a set of training or examples it's been given. But I don't have to tell it how to do that. Now that actually takes quite a bit of data, and it's really not surprising, because think about how we make decisions, and we make tens of thousands of decisions every day. You do that by looking around, your surrounding circumstances, you grab information, probably you don't even know what you're taking in, you mentally make connections, and then you try to make the best decision you can with the context and the information you have at the time, and then you move on. It shouldn't be any different for our AI. AI requires that same type of information, that context and that connections. So it can learn based on the context. It can make ad adjustments, especially as circumstances change, because they always change, don't they? And graphs are actually the best, fastest, most reliable way to add context to whatever you're doing. Um, so it's a natural fit. And AI without context is really limited. And I. I love this example because it always makes me laugh. Uh, this is four little words, we saw her duck. You can interpret this many different ways. What does that really mean? Does it mean I ducked? Hopefully nobody threw anything at me. Um, but yeah, maybe I, I ducked, we saw her duck. Um, it also could mean that we saw her pet bird. Uh, it might mean somebody named we saw her pet bird. Or maybe even, Maybe even we went over to dinner and we were gonna have duck and we saw her duck. Okay, that's not so pleasant. There's probably some other ones as well. But so without this context, AI is very limited. It's narrowly focused on exactly what we've trained it to and only that data. You have subpar predictions. Uh, this morning, Lance talked about uh, James Fowler's work that showed that relationships are highly predictive of future behavior. If you don't include those, you're losing out on uh, what could be very good predictive indicators. And you have less transparency, which of course, if we can't explain how a decision was made, then you, you can't hold people accountable and you're not gonna trust uh, how decisions were made either. So it's probably not surprising why researchers are also using graphs to enhance their AI to push beyond the limits. Uh, this is a chart uh, 20 of uh, starting in 2010 to uh, 2018, looking at how many AI research papers use graphs uh, as part of their research. Uh, it was under 1,000 in 2010. By 2018, we're just under 4,000. So a fourfold increase in, in eight years. And so we're seeing that accelerate uh, significantly as well. And so if we think about graphs, adding context, and context for AI, why is it that we naturally, and I do this all the time, I almost talk about graphs as if they were context. And, and that's because graphs were built to understand relationships. That's how graph theory started. Uh, they were built to understand relationships and they were built with relationships. And that's significant because in nature, you don't get any unrelated, uh, isolated data points. Uh, there, it was said earlier today that you know, news stories, everything starts to look like a network or a graph when you start looking at it. And that's because in nature, data is very connected. And graphs help us add in that fabric of connections in the data we have so we can actually hook it together. And it enriches that data to add more value. And if we think about the stars, lots of individual pretty points of light, very nice to look at. Uh, but that individual star doesn't mean a whole lot in and of itself. I can't do much with it other than admire it. But when I start to look at it in context of other stars and where it is in the night sky, I now have a constellation. I can now navigate uh, or at least get in a general direction. This is not quite the Big Dipper, but let's pretend and uh, say that generally that's north. Uh, and that, of course, was how, uh, how we used to navigate uh, quite a long time ago. And if we wanted to add more context and more information, we then start to have maps. 
How do I get from point A to B? How many routes are there to point A to B? Uh, what's the most efficient manner for me to do that? And then if I add in more context, like traffic, how do I reroute during different times of day when the traffic's bad? And then if I add even more context, we can, we can see things like what Lyft is doing to innovate that you're now able to add more information and layer on more context and add more value. I'm always amazed that I get into, like I did last night, into my Lyft ride share at the airport, you know, and I get to the hotel and it's coordinated between myself and some other rider. It's picked us up, both up efficiently. It's been efficient for the driver, for us, a pleasant experience and everything happens seamlessly. And so the more you can add context, the, the more you can add value to the data and what you're already doing. And thinking about graphs as context, uh, Neo4j invented the property graph model in 2002 uh, based on a, a sketch on the back of a napkin. Uh, I don't know if anybody still has that napkin. That, maybe that'll be my next, uh, my next mission to find that napkin. But the, I'm always amazed at such a simple, elegant dots and lines can it have so much flexibility and allow us to innovate on it? We've got nodes with properties and relationships with attributes, extremely flexible and has allowed us to scale to millions, to be able to process millions of data points and connections uh, per second and analyze billions of nodes and relationships. So why would we put the context of graphs with responsible AI together. How, how do these things fit? Um, there are really four different areas uh, that I believe are really important and they fall into two different larger buckets. And I've got examples um, on each one of these four areas. One is, one bucket is around robustness and having solutions that are more predictively accurate and having solutions that are more flexible. And the other area about responsible AI I think is important is trustworthiness and how do we uh, enhance and increase the fairness and the explainability as well with our models. So the first example is a rather um, serious example. This, these numbers are a few years old. Uh, the, with the opioid crisis, it was estimated uh, several years ago that in the insurance fraud area, that there was $72 billion a year in opioid uh, insurance fraud. Uh, more recent estimates, not looking at the insurance cost, but looking at healthcare, uh, legal, childcare, support care, that they were at, we believe we are at, and this is just the US, 100 billion a year in cost. So pretty significant issue, and there's, they believe that fraud is an area that we can target because we have the data. Uh, we know where the money flows. And there's actually been some really interesting work that's been done to try to do uh, fraud prediction on opioids and looking at that insurance information, looking into the relationships between doctors, pharmacies, and patients, and looking at how tight are those communities using graph algorithms to do community detection. There's certain, I was talking to somebody earlier about fraud and their fraud has shape to it. And graphs are really good at understanding uh, the topology of your data, and you can use things like relationships and community detection to then extract out uh, different communities and then use your machine learning as they did in this research paper to estimate which structures of communities were more predictive of fraud. Uh, there's actually some really interesting research going on in this area and using graphs to do graph feature engineering uh, has a tendency to improve uh, your model accuracy. You don't have to change what you're doing in the models. In fact, you shouldn't change your normal machine learning models. You should just add these predictive features to it uh, and uh, kind of increase the accuracy you have with the data you already have. Um, there's also, well, one of my colleagues, Mark Quinslin, is doing some research, is just starting to come out and doing some talks on more recent data and looking at opioid uh, fraud as well. So if you're interested in this area, come find me later and I'll start to, uh, to filter out that information as it comes out because there's some interesting work that uh, some of our colleagues are looking at here. So beyond accuracy, um, another example is having confidence in things that are fairly serious. Uh, driverless cars is one of those areas that 
I sometimes get very nervous about, especially when you hear the stories about cars being easily tricked by stickers. Uh, one of the uh, recent ones was the Tesla car that changed lanes based on stickers on the, on the, uh, in the lanes. Um, makes us very apprehensive. But I think it's really not just about cars, but it's about anything important that has autonomous decisions or semi-autonomous decisions. Uh, situational awareness is very important in these kind of circumstances, especially if they're implemented in such a wide area, uh, being able to be flexible, being able to learn based on context, not just on a specific static data point is really important. And being able to incorporate adjacent information, which is what graphs are all about, right? It's not about the first hop or the fourth hop, maybe it's about the eighth hop out. Uh, out of curiosity, does anybody know what the number one cause for accidents are in regards to semi-autonomous or autonomous vehicles? I, I can't, uh, actually no, it's being slammed in from behind by a human driver. So, so it's not that human drivers aren't smart in these cases, it's that the semi-autonomous cars don't act like we expect them to. Uh, in particular, they have a hard problem with birds on the road. So you and I, you're on a highway, flock of birds, you just go. You know, the birds will get out of the way, hopefully, most of them will get out of the way. <laughs> And we may choose to break for a small animal in the road if nobody else is around. You know, it's just safe, go ahead and do it. But if you're in traffic and it's raining and maybe it's a little dark, who knows, and the little bunny rabbit comes out, maybe you don't break. Maybe it's safer to keep going. Feel bad for the bunny rabbit. But the autonomous cars don't deal well with birds uh, plastic bags flittering in the road, a boot in one case. Um, so dealing with the situation more comprehensively, being flexible to different situations is gonna be essential for us to take AI so that it can be flexible to different circumstances. Uh, another area is about humans behaving badly, uh, humans trying to subvert systems. This example is uh, in from a financial services where we had some very, smart criminals uh, trying to misrepresent data in one area uh, to fly under radar that was be reporting in another area because the data filtered through. And so they were smart enough to know if I, if I tweak information over here, it'll change results you know, on the back end. Uh, and you know, financial services, that's very important. I also think about this in other situations. Uh, in other scenarios, I wanna be able to rely on my AI systems and what com comes out of them. And I could have the best system in the world, but if my data has been manipulated, I, how do I rely on that? What if, I'm, what if I'm managing an energy grid or maybe more relevant for many of us at the moment, um, what if we're talking about voting systems? I need to know where the data's been. I need to know who's touched it. I need to know when it was changed. I need to know what the chain of relationships are and how that data may be used somewhere else. And that's a classic graph data lineage problem. It's not sexy but it is so essential to be able to trust your systems that you can trust the data. Not just, was it good data? Maybe it's not biased data, maybe it's fantastic data. But if somebody tweaked that data, I no longer can trust the outcome. And graphs are really good at allowing us to track the chain of data change and the ripple effects for it. So another, going back, I guess, a bit to this idea of amplifying bias. Um, this again is, I'm gonna show you an example of skewed uh, based on either practices or bias data. Um, we're not really sure. This is an example that again is uh, based on the Compass software. Uh, this example has uh, Vernon on the left and Brisha on the right. Uh, a risk assessment is also used in many cities when you get booked. So this is before you even uh, are indicted or you know have criminal charges, they assess whether you're going to reoffend. Vernon uh, had two armed robbery charges and one attempted armed robbery. Uh, Brisha had uh, she borrowed a bike uh, from her neighbor's yard, and uh, she had a couple misdemeanors. Vernon was caught shoplifting. Vernon got this low score of three, and this is three out of ten. Brisha got a score of eight on this. Brisha never offended again. Uh, Vernon went on uh, to commit grand theft. So this Compass software 
and I won't go into uh, more stories, ProPublica actually did quite a bit of work on it. They made the data available, uh, but it's consistently been inaccurate and it is black box and that we're not allowed to look at how it's uh, looking at information. Uh, and it consistently gave uh, African-Americans higher risk scores uh, than uh, white Americans. And it's still in use today. So how, how can we approach this? Well, one is of course to make this something that we're all aware of. Um, but the other way that you can use graphs in particular, uh, because this is a graph talk on how to approach some of this, is to just reveal the bias in the first place. And part of that is knowing where your data came from, who collected it, how they collected it, when did they collect it. Um, there's all these chain of events in just data collection and how it's used, that if we better understand that, that actually is a very much a graph problem as well, um, that we can help to reveal bias that may not be apparent in our data right away. A graph, so graphs can add this context, and then as I explained in the opioid example, you could also use graphs to add different predictive features that might be based on relationships as opposed to demographics or like where your zip code may happen to be. So my last example is not an AI example, but I think it's important. Um, I think the 737 MAX issues uh, involving not incorporating or being impacted by not incorporating the human element and pilot behavior is a really good uh, note for us to take on why being human-centric when we talk about AI because of the reach is so important. So a lot of our AI solutions look at very, I wanna say idealized circumstances. And maybe it's not idealized, maybe it's just, you know, if you're a developer and you're, you're coding to what you were told to code for and the personas that you were told to code for and you've done that, how, you know, how do you know that you're incorporating all the possibilities there? And humans tend to act in unusual ways, so it's hard to predict. And one of the things that graphs can at least help in this regards is graphs, this is a little whiteboard model, um, kind of hard to see, but it's basically circles and lines on a whiteboard. The, these are the way we think about systems, these are the way we think about the world. So you can use this as a tool and talk to users, incorporate human behavior, incorporate your expert advice to say, here's what we're doing with our data. Should we? Is this the right thing to do? And graphs have that ability to just more naturally be uh, inclusive of kind of that human uh, point of view. So what's, what's next? What's coming uh, in graphs and in AI in the future? Um, well, the first one shouldn't really be a surprise to you guys by now. We're already seeing human values be implemented and driving change in AI regulation. And I think that when this starts to uh, accelerate, it's also gonna accelerate the adoption of AI itself because AI is not going to be widely adopted until we feel that it is trustworthy and it's aligned to our values. So it behooves us as if we want to accelerate adoption that we consider the human values in the society in which it's implemented. Um, the other thing is that we are already seeing a lot of tractions in graph and data science, uh, machine learning and AI, and a number of different use cases. Um, I've just thrown up a few. Uh, drug discovery, I was talking to somebody about that earlier. Uh, financial crimes, fraud, anti-money laundering, uh, recommendations, uh, especially in retail, we see a lot there. Uh, but things like churn prediction and subscription service as well, cybersecurity, predictive maintenance. So lots of different use cases. But I think what's going to change in the future is that it's just going to be standard. If you have an AI system, there's going to be some kind of graph component somewhere. In fact, uh, about a month ago, I was at a conference in Anchorage, and I had an interesting chat with a gentleman, an AI researcher from a large, uh, well-known software company, uh, and asked him what he saw as the evolution or, or co-evolution of graphs and AI. And he said, in the very near future, any large enterprise uh, AI system will have some graph component in it. And part of that is bringing in context and the power uh, to remove some of the limits of AI. And in fact, um, Google DeepMinds, uh, as well as some other researchers, published this paper late last year, looking at what's the next frontier for AI. 
and it was graph native learning. And they were looking for what are the shortcomings of AI today and what's it gonna take in machine learning today and what's it gonna take for us to overcome them in the future. And they felt that graph networks were, the bigger, were a bigger idea than any one other machine learning area. And the reason was that graph's ability to abstract and generalize on structure. So that is one of the magic things of these you know, simple dots and lines, is that you can abstract a lot about the topology and the structure of your data and what's really going on. And you can represent relationships and generalize to, to other uh, areas, which is an area that um, the AI really needs to expand into. Um, it's a difficult paper, uh, but what the heck does graph native learning mean? Uh, I won't pretend to understand it completely, uh, but when I think about it, I think of it as a way to implement machine learning inside of a graph, in a graph structure itself. And the idea is that users can add in data as a graph, as connected data. You can do your learning and preserve each transient state and still have the graph preserved. And then when you come out with your solution, it's still a graph. So graph in, graph out, preserve the transient states. Now, this sounds simple, difficult paper, sounds simple, uh, but what's so amazing about that is that's gonna allow experts to be able to track and validate the decision path of some of our AI solutions. A uh, big problem with the, the black box um, problems we have today. So it's gonna allow us to track that a little better. And it's also gonna allow us to be more accurate with less data and to be able to bub bubble up uh, some of the more important features. So just trying to figure out what's predictive in your data can be a big challenge. You spend a lot of time on it and still be wrong. Um, we believe that this approach will help uh, bubble up what, uh, what those significant features are. And what that really means for the rest of us is that we're gonna be able to go from these rigid, narrowly focused uh, black box uh, systems and go to models that are more flexible, uh, that are more accurate and are more transparent. So this is years out. This is just really exciting research. We think it's a couple years out. We're watching it very closely. I think this is gonna change the way uh, that a lot of us run AI in the future, but um, really early, uh, but very exciting work. And if you're interested in the paper, come find me and I'll, I'll make sure you can, uh, you can find it. Um, the other, thing that I want to bring up is we've been talking, I've been talking a lot about kind of these big ideas, very conceptual. But for those of you in the audience that code or manage people that code, I, I realize this can seem really daunting, but there are some very practical things we can do today to be more responsible about AI. And I'll make sure that the, the slides are, are distributed because I realize it's a little small on some of these. Uh, and so there are things we can do today that aren't really that difficult to get started. If you are just starting, uh, the first thing I would say is please know what's in your data and track your data. Very simple, that's table stakes. Um, hopefully you use Neo4j to do that, but graphs are very good for do that to do that. But regardless, you, you need to know what's in your data and you should be tracking it. Uh, you can do things like debiasing your data. There are toolkits out there. This is one example, the uh, AI Fairness 360 toolkit. They can help balance your data and see if there is imbalance in it. Uh, you can do things like involve experts. Please involve your experts. Your data doesn't necessarily uh, speak for what is most predictive or what success looks like. So involving those uh, expertise is important. And then of course there are resources for developers like the Algorithmic Justice League where you can get more tools uh, to understand how you can do things like more fair, um, for, fair algorithms. Um, I'll try not to go through all of these in details, but some of the other things you can do, especially in the graph area, is to, like add those predictive relationships. We talked a little bit about graph feature engineering. There's more information on our uh, the Neo4j website on that in particular. Uh, you can also, if you're doing um, things like behavior analysis, you can you can look for counterfactuals as well if you're looking for causality. So you can just use Neo4j for a search uh, to look for uh, what you might not be. Um, predicting, uh, but things like model exchanges, uh, using interpretable models where you can. So if you have a black box model that's very accurate and you have an interpretable model that's very accurate, please use the interpretable model. 
uh, use the model that you can explain uh, unless you don't have uh, such a model. Uh, the other things you can do if you're in the process of implementing or about to implement, you can add context, uh, like a knowledge graph. So think about a chat bot. You can add knowledge graph to a chat bot to make it more intelligent so it sends people to the right department in your store. You can do things, um, actually another table stakes that you should be doing is some sort of risk assessment. If you're not doing a risk assessment today, you need to. Uh, you need to look at how, uh, what your model performing poorly or badly uh, is going to do. So it could be something as simple as a checklist. I've talked to teams that it's just the developers, they created some checklists. At least that's something. And I've also talked to uh, companies that are doing full on committees to review a model before you have to be in place. And this is very domain specific. I wish I could point you to one perfect example. I will say if you're out there searching, the insurance companies uh, in the insurance industry seems to be a little bit ahead of the other industries in risk assessment, uh, maybe because it's the business they've, they've been in, uh, but doing things to develop the checklist and the full, um, some of the committees as well to look at that. Uh, final thing is think about um, explanations if you have high stakes decisions and insist on something that's explainable. So final three thoughts uh, on uh, the future of AI. The first one is it's not all about machine learning. I do this, I know other people do this, but context, structure, reasoning are really important for us to improve AI. Graphs, connected data are just a key element that allows us to do that, and that's why we're seeing the research involving graph um, go up significantly. Um, the other thing is, and I love this quote from Vivian Ming, if you're not thinking about the human problem, AI is not gonna solve it for you. We cannot AI our way out of all of our problems. And in particular, if we're codifying our own human flaws, we've gotta deal with the human flaws as well at the same time, or we're just gonna amplify. And the danger of that in AI is the power and the reach is so significant. Um, I would probably say more significant than it has uh, ever been. So final quote here, I'm gonna tweak just a little bit. This is from my past. Uh, so I would say our future is really whatever we make it and what we decide to make it. And so why not make a choice uh, to make it as good as possible? So if you wanna hear more about this topic or graphs in general, three-day conference, April, New York, uh, amazing conference, good individuals, uh, and, uh, and really the largest graph uh, conference in, in the world. Um, also, uh, just so you know, later on, I think during the next break, um, I will be out in the foyer um, with uh, some of the graph algorithms books. I'm one of the co-authors, and we have a few extra copies that I'll be out there and ready to sign. So with that, thank you everybody for your attention. I really appreciate it.